Australia, the smallest continent, and one of Earth's largest countries, lie between the Pacific and Indian Oceans in the Southern Hemisphere. Australia's capital is Canberra. She's located in the southeast between Sydney and Melbourne, which is the economic and cultural centre. The Australian mainland extends from west to east for nearly 2,500 miles, and from the Cape York Peninsula in the northeast to Wilson's Promontory in the southeast, for nearly 2,000 miles. To the south, Australian jurisdiction extends a further 310 miles to the southern extremity of the island of Tasmania, and in the north, it extends to the southern shores of Papua New Guinea. Australia is separated from Indonesia to the northwest by the Timor and Arafura Seas, from Papua New Guinea to the northeast by the Coral Sea and the Torres Strait, from the Coral Sea Islands Territory by the Great Barrier Reef, from New Zealand to the southeast by the Tasman Sea, and from Antarctica in the far south by the Indian Ocean. Australia has been called the oldest continent, the last of lands, and the last frontier. Those descriptions typify the world's fascination with Australia, but they are somewhat unsatisfactory. In simple physical terms, the age of much of the continent is certainly impressive, Most of the rocks providing the foundation of Australian landforms were formed during Precambrian and Paleozoic time, but the ages of the cores of all the continents are approximately the same. On the other hand, whereas the landscape history of extensive areas in Europe and North America has been profoundly influenced by events and processes that occurred since late in the last ice age, Roughly the past 25,000 years, in Australia scientists use a more extensive timescale that takes into account the great antiquity of the continent's landscape. Australia is the last of lands only in the sense that it was the last continent, apart from Antarctica, to be explored by Europeans. At least 60,000 years before European explorers sailed into the South Pacific, the first Aboriginal explorers had arrived from Asia, and by 20,000 years ago, they had spread throughout the mainland and its chief island outlier, Tasmania. The most striking characteristics of the vast country are its global isolation, its low relief, and the aridity of its surface. Australia's isolation from other continents explains much of the singularity of its plant and animal life. Its unique flora and fauna include hundreds of kinds of eucalyptus trees and the only egg-laying mammals on Earth. The Great Barrier Reef, off the east coast of Queensland, is the greatest mass of coral in the world and one of the world's foremost tourist attractions. The country's low relief results from the long and extensive erosive action of the forces of wind, rain, and the heat of the sun during the great periods of geologic time when the continental mass was elevated well above sea level. Australia is both the flattest continent and except for Antarctica, the driest. 
Seen from the air, its vast plains, sometimes the color of dry blood, more often tawny like a lion's skin, may seem to be one huge desert. One can fly the roughly 2,000 miles to Sydney from Darwin in the north, or to Sydney from Perth in the west, without seeing a town or anything. A good deal of the central depression and western plateau is indeed desert. Yet, appearances can be deceptive. Moreover, the coastal rim is almost everywhere exempted from the prevailing flatness and aridity. In particular, the East Coast, where European settlement began and where the majority of Australians now live, is topographically quite diverse and is comparatively well watered and fertile. Inland from the coast runs a chain of highlands, known as the Great Dividing Range. From the coast that range, which may be anything from 20 miles to 200 miles distant, often appears as a bold range of mountains, though few of its peaks exceed 5,000 feet. In fact, it is more like the escarpment of a giant plateau, formed of gently rolling hills, which slopes imperceptibly down to the western plains. In such a huge continent, there are wide variations in landforms and climate. The thickly wooded ranges of the Great Divide have little in common with the treeless, sun-baked plains of the inland. There is a vast difference between the red rocks and monumental hills of Central Australia, and the tropical rainforests and sugar plantations of northern Queensland. To many visitors, Australia may not seem like a pretty country, but it has a unique and haunting beauty that fascinates those who get to know it. Australia is a land of vast plains. Only 6% of the island continent is above 2,000 feet in elevation. Its highest peak, Mount Kosciuszka, rises to only 7,310 feet. That situation stems in part from the long periods of geologic time when Australia has been subject to weathering and erosion. Patterns of faulting and folding in large measure, control the distribution and attitude of rocks, which play a significant part in determining the shape of the land surface. But the nature and intensity of the processes at work at and near the land surface, also give rise to characteristic assemblages of forms. Australia is an arid continent, Fully one-third of its area is occupied by desert, another third is steppe or semi-desert, and only in the northeast, southeast, and southwest, is adequate precipitation to support vegetation that significantly protects the land surface from weathering. Permanently flowing rivers are found only in the eastern and southwestern regions, and in Tasmania. The major exception is the Murray River, 
a stream that rises in the Mount Kashchushka area in the eastern uplands. As a result, it acquires a volume sufficient to survive the passage across the arid and semi-arid plains that bear its name, to reach the southern ocean southeast of Adelaide. Many areas, notably the Nullarbor Plain, which is underlain by limestone, and the Sand Ridge Deserts, are without surface drainage, but there are underground streams. A map of Australia can be misleading, though many lakes are depicted in the interior, the fact is that many of them are now salt lakes that contain no water for years on end. The Precambrian Western Core Area, known geologically as a shield, is subdivided by long, straight fractures called lineaments. Those fractures, most obvious in the north and west, delineate prominent rectangular or rhomboidal blocks, some of which have been raised to form uplands, others have been depressed to form lowlands or topographic basins. Within such structurally defined areas as the Kimberleys, the Mount Isa Highlands, and the Pilbara, the nature of the land surface varies according to the type and disposition of the rock outcrops. In the Kimberleys and the Muller Range, there are extensive outcrops of flat-lying massive sandstone that have been dissected to give rise to striking isolated rock features known variously as plateaus, mesas, and buttes. Under those circumstances, local joints and bedding planes in the rocks, combined with the permeable nature of the bedrock, control the local landforms. Similar plateau forms dominate the Pilbara and Arnhem land, though in the former region horizontally bedded or only gently warped massive ironstone formations, together with massive sandstones, give rise to prominent bluffs, bordering the plateau assemblages. At the margins of the Kimberleys, and in the southern part of the Pilbara, dipping rock strata have been differentially eroded to form ridges and valleys. Such features are also extensively and well developed in the uplands of Central Australia, in the Isa Highlands, and in the Stirling Range of the Southwest. In all those areas, it is the sandstones and quartzites that underlie the upstanding ridges, the intervening valleys being eroded in siltstones or shales, and in all those areas the pattern and the plan of ridge and valley, reflects the pattern of folding in the underlying rocks. In the far southwest of the shield, and especially in the northern areas, precipitation is sufficient to support considerable vegetation and is regular enough for streams to flow seasonally. There, the work of rivers in shaping the land surface is more obvious and widespread. The landscape consists essentially of valleys and intervening divides, the precise form of each depending on local structure. But in such areas, the rate of landscape change is more rapid than in the arid zones. The interior lowlands is dominated by three major basins, the Carpentaria Basin, the Air Basin, and the Murray Basin. The Carpentaria and Air Basins are separated by such minute residual relief elements as Mount Brown and Mount Fort Bowen in northwestern Queensland. The Air and Murray Basins are entirely terrestrial, but the Carpentaria is partly inundated by the sea. Her plains, occupying the basin of the same name, form a narrow lowland corridor between the Isa Highlands and the Inesley Uplands. They are drained by the Leichhardt, Flinders, 
and Gilbert rivers and in the south take the form of broadly rolling plains underlain by heavy gray lime and rich soils. In the north, however, there are extensive flat depositional plains, some of them related to swamps from the Pleistocene epoch, some associated with the present floodplains of the braided river systems. In the context of such extraordinary environmental time frames, neither the Aboriginal peoples nor the European settlers can be described as long-term residents, yet in their brief time, they have already modified the landscape considerably and in most ways deleteriously. The Europeans in particular have been responsible for initially minor, but later significant and widespread, changes, notably considerable soil erosion. Clearing vegetation for agricultural purposes, overgrazing, introducing exotic plants and animals, making tracks and roads, and even clearing stones from paddocks, all have rendered the land surface more susceptible to soil erosion. In general, the continental pattern of soils is closely related to climatic factors. Mineral, or skeletal soils, exist over much of arid Australia that contains virtually no organic content, and have developed little depth, they may consist merely of a rough mantle of weathered rock. Gypsum is present in many desert loams and arid red earth. Australia is an arid continent. Over two-thirds of its landmass, precipitation per annum averages less than 20 inches, and over one-third of it is less than 10 inches. Little more than one-tenth of the continent receives more than 40 inches per year. As has been noted, in winter the snowfields of Tasmania and the Mount Kosciuszka area can be extensive, but on the whole, Australia is an extremely hot country. The principal features of Australia's climate stem from its position, shape, and size. Australia is mainly a compact tropical and near-tropical continent. In summer, when the sun is directly overhead in northern Australia, temperatures are extremely high. Heat waves are common, and though the highest amounts of solar radiation are received in northern South Australia, the highest temperatures and longest heat waves are recorded in the northwest of Western Australia. Temperatures in winter remain moderate, except in the uplands of Tasmania and southeastern Australia, where snow is common. Night frosts are common in winter throughout southern Australia and in the interior. Some two centuries ago Australia was in a nearly primal condition, unmodified by the practices of large-scale conventional agriculture. The continent's prehistory is so recent, that a scattering of old eucalypts can be found still standing, bearing the great scars of canoes or shields cut from the bark by the Aboriginal peoples. As nomadic hunters and gatherers without herds or crops, 
Aboriginal people burned much of Australia's native vegetation, both deliberately and haphazardly. Fire, more particularly its frequency, had a profound influence on much of Australia's native vegetation, the surviving remnants of which have become difficult to manage. Since Europeans arrived on the continent, cataclysmic changes have been wrought in its biota. Australia has experienced an immense loss of biodiversity because of the growing population and the need for more space, the consumption of more resources, and the production of more waste. In the process, they affected the extinction of many native species, and through sheer decimation and reduction of habitat, pushed many more to the brink of extinction. The distribution of climates, topography, and soils that have produced the zones and ecological variation of Australian vegetation has also been reflected in the distribution of animal life. Australia probably has between 200,000 and 300,000 species, about 100,000 of which have been described. There are some 250 species of native mammals, 550 species of land and aquatic birds, 680 species of reptiles, 190 species of frogs, and more than 2,000 species of marine and freshwater fish. In the varied environments of the tropical zone, Species confined to the rainforests of the mountainous northeast include the tree kangaroo, and the gorgeous birdwing butterflies. The animals of the Aramayan zone are characterized by their ability to survive under extremely arid conditions and irregular rainfall. Examples include the marsupial mole, and the water-holding frog of the genus Cyclorana. The fauna of the eucalyptus forests, and other habitats of the temperate zone, contains animals whose life cycles rely on regular winter rainfall. Many are highly adapted to the eucalyptus forests. The koala depends on the foliage of just a few species of forest eucalyptus. Australia has its share of potentially dangerous, as well as commercially useful animals. The large saltwater crocodile is known to eat humans. Of the many poisonous snakes, the most dangerous to humans are taipans, smooth snakes, tiger snakes, brown snakes, and death adders. About one-seventh of Australia's snake species pose a deadly threat to humans. There are many poisonous spiders, the best known being the funnel web spider, and the red back. Both of those have caused human deaths, but only a minute proportion of Australia's spiders are dangerous. Ticks, and internal parasitic worms, are mainly harmful to stock and domestic pets, and some blood-sucking insects are disease carriers. The larvae of the sheep blowfly Lucilia, attack sheep, and cause losses worth millions of dollars to the wool industry. Locusts, weevils, and insect larvae of various sorts do great damage in agriculture.
Most of Australia's soils are mediocre or poor by world standards. There are no extensive areas of rich, adaptable soils that compare to those of the great intensive farming regions of other sizable countries. Chemical deficiencies are particularly common, and it is often necessary to apply generous amounts of phosphate and traces of numerous other nutrients. With good reason, Australia is regularly described as the driest of the inhabited continents, and vast areas of the country are unsuitable for agricultural production. Land degradation became a major issue in the 1980s, when media coverage became intense and well-directed education programs proliferated. A decade of Landcare Plan was proclaimed for the 1990s, and a nationally coordinated schedule was drawn up to promote new cultivation methods, extensive tree planting, modest and adventurous engineering solutions, and wholesale changes in production systems. Australia is an important source of export cereals, meat, sugar, dairy produce, and fruit. Other important crops include cotton, rice, tobacco, temperate and tropical fruits, corn, sorghum, oil seeds, and a host of other items reflecting the expansive latitudinal range of farming operations. Winemaking for domestic and export markets is pursued in every state but is most significant in the southern parts of the country. The sector experienced spectacular growth in the 1990s, with the production of wine grapes increasing by three-fifths during the decade to supply some 1,200 wineries. Nearly half of the wine exports are directed to the United Kingdom. Other major markets include the United States, New Zealand, Canada, and Germany. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please don't forget to give a like, share, and subscribe.